Hello, everybody. And uh, if you'll forgive a slightly bombastic globalized greeting, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you're joining us from. We are absolutely delighted to have you with us uh, this particular point in the global day. A welcome to what I hope will be an hour of a thought-provoking conversation with Debatish Roy Chowdhury and John Keane to celebrate and interrogate their new book, To Kill a Democracy, India's Passage to Despotism, which I'm delighted to be holding here, doubly delighted in fact, because uh, one of the trivial indignities of the current covid ridden world we live in is that this is actually the first book that I published in the last 16 months that I have actually held in my hand. So I'm delighted about that. And I'm especially delighted that it's this book, with all uh, due apologies to any authors of mine who might be uh, joining us today. Uh, we published a week or so ago in the UK, and the book's soon going to be available uh, worldwide. That is, once it's navigated the current chaos of the global freight system. Um, but it is available to pre-order from your uh, friendly online retailer, and I suspect that phrase may go viral because it's very rare, never happened before, I suspect, that uh, a publisher has described Amazon as friendly. Anyway, I mentioned uh, both conversation and interrogation at the start, and more in the spirit of the former than the latter, we would very much welcome your questions about John and Deb's take on India and the themes that they draw out in the book. You'll see at the bottom of the screens that you all have the option to ask a question. So um, questions, please, in the Ask a Question button on the little um, uh, window that that opens up, not in the chat. Um, and we're going to operate a suitably democratic process there, whereby you can also vote for the questions that you like, and those questions with the most votes will be the ones that I'll ask first after I've monopolized the conversation for the first part of our chat uh, today. Um, I imagine that you'll know the authors, but let me briefly introduce them. Uh, Batish Roy Chowdhury is an award-winning journalist currently based in Hong Kong. He's worked across the world with his byline appearing in a great range of distinguished publications. I've been reading him in Time magazine quite a lot recently, and I urge you to keep your eyes open there. He writes fantastic pieces. Uh, he's everything that's best about his profession, to my mind. He's incisive, engaging, campaigning. Uh, John Keane, Professor of Politics at the University of Sydney, as well as a research professor at the Vazette Bay in Berlin. That's what the B stands for, of course. He's an accomplished, much cited political theorist, but he's not one of those backroom, boiler room sorts of engineer types. He sees the big picture. He grasps the really key issues and writes about them elegantly, accessibly, and with solid common sense as well. So I'm going to let you into a little bit of let a little sunshine in on the, on the magic of publishing now, because when John, John Keane first told me that he was writing a big think piece about the struggles of Indian democracy, but moreover writing it with a uh, leading journalist from the region, blending life stories and scholarly insight into the nature of democracy, I thought two things. I thought, what a wonderful, wonderful idea, first of all. And then I thought, there's no way that's going to work. Good scholarship and good journalism. I like both those things. They're a little bit like cheese and chocolate, though. I like cheese. I like chocolate. But cheesy chocolate? I'm not really sure. But I have to say, it does work beautifully. Absolutely brilliantly, in fact. How wrong I was, again. Uh, it's an un unusual combination, though, I think. And so I'd like to begin by asking John how you actually met, Deb, and what, what inspired the idea to collaborate. Well, thank you, Dominic. Um, thank you uh, to everybody for coming. Uh, thank you, Dominic, for your unwavering support during the last uh, several years, your professionalism, your thoughtfulness, uh, a dream editor. Um, people recommended uh, Deb to me as a distinguished uh, journalist uh, who was at the time uh, working at the South China Morning Post. Uh, we met in Hong Kong. We had a very long lunch. Uh, we talked. I had just returned from Wuhan, uh, where I was actually teaching a summer school um, on the subject of democracy. So we had a long discussion about uh, Janatantra, democracy, or in Bengali, Ganatantra. And uh, I tried to explain uh, to Deb that I had for some years been interested in 
uh, increasingly in um, the way that as democracy spread globally, uh, democracy became more worldly and that um, there was something that bothered me about the American bias in so much research on democracy. Um, it spoke with an American accent, liberal democracy, and that I was I had tried my hand at writing uh, about India in the history of democracy uh, book a little too gushingly. So we talked and I discovered that Deb had fire in his belly and ice in his head about India and uh, the subject of democracy. I knew that he was a great writer, um, a humble man, uh, someone with a great sense of humor and a journalist um, with a difference, not one of these, you know, tittering, jeering, uh, empty barrel uh, journalists, uh, not a journalist at all. So during the course of that lunch, I tried to persuade him that I was a white boy, you know, who he might be able to work with uh, that. We discussed, I remember, Satyajit Ray's films. I'm a great fan of those, um, a fellow Bengali. I tried to persuade him that I hadn't read too much V.S. Naipaul and, you know, the image of India as, as a sort of filthy map with too many Muslims. Um, I tried to convince him that we could write this book democratically. And, um, and finally, I think I persuaded him that I was not, um, that I didn't live up to the standard definition of a professor. You know, a professor is someone who reaches a certain age and is appointed to a chair um, because at that point has forgotten the meaning of the word relevance. And so um, began a three year collaboration and it's been a great personal and intellectual and political uh, thrill, Deb. Uh, thank you, thank you, John. Uh, and thank you, Dominic, for this opportunity. And thank you, especially for making the book happen. Without you, this book wouldn't have, we wouldn't have this book. Uh, now, uh, I would like to jump in on how I met uh, John, because I live in Hong Kong. And like, thanks to Hong Kong, I had uh, begun to get very interested in the idea of democracy as a subject. Uh, as I witnessed the growing uh, hunger for democracy all around me here in this very well-run city with very uh, high levels of civil liberties and a very strong rule of law. And this was happening even as back in India, I could see that uh, democracy was uh, hardly living up to its ideals. So I was fascinated by this duality and I had this idea of a book and uh, on uh, Indian democracy. And I thought that, you know, like uh, I bring India to the table. Yes, I understand India. I can, I can do a lot of field work on India, but I need somebody who understands democracy. And uh, John had by then written a couple of articles for the magazine that I was running here. And um, I was very impressed by his work. I started to read up his uh, other works. And I thought that, well, um, this is the man. This is the man who understands democracy. And after that long lunch, I was doubly convinced that uh, this is the man I could work with. Because as you said, Dominic, very correctly, this is not a combination of uh, a journalist and an academic is not a great combination, especially when they are not in the same city. And especially because the only time they have met is one lunch. So it's not like I know John for 10 years or 15 years. I've just met him a couple of times. And and so we took it from there. Dominic. Okay, thank you. Um, that's fascinating, um, um, particularly fascinating for me because we've never actually discussed these issues in the, in the long time that we've been working together on this book. So I'm gonna permit myself one last nerdy publisher question. Uh, if people would just bear with me for a moment. Um, I just was interested to know from both your perspectives, how you found the process of working with the other, how you actually got on with the process of writing and how that actually gelled, because they are two worlds coming together. Uh, and I absolutely take those points that Deb has just made, which seem to me absolutely spot on, but just how did it work? 
Okay, uh, so I was kind of surprised that John was open to the idea of life experiences. You know, like as a journalist, I have always felt that any account of a democracy is incomplete without a description of the lived experience of its people. So uh, personal stories of the kind that you see in journalistic writings and long features are an important component of the book. In the book that I had originally in mind, every chapter would be woven around multiple personal stories. So I was immensely surprised that John, an acclaimed political theorist, um, was actually open to the idea of personal stories as a narrative device. And maybe John can explain more why he uh, agreed to, to you know, do that. But uh, I was very surprised that John was open to it. John. Yeah, well, I surprised myself, but um, there were some challenges, um, I think we have to say. Um, teaching, teaching Deb, um, how to do footnotes and the relevance of footnotes <laughs> was a great challenge. Um, I, I had to, to, to calm Deb uh, when the topic of an index came up, uh, and I solved that by agreeing to, to write, uh, to prepare the index. Um, there was one other challenge, um, which was becoming familiar with and knowing how to pronounce words and phrases in um, English or probably Banglish, um, which I learned uh, in the last uh, three years. Uh, sheen dimming. Um, we are like that only. Yes, I don't um, do that. <laughs> uh, doing the needful. Um, we we would that. Um, Pre, um, yeah, preponing, um, um, uh, reverting back. Uh, I learned the phrase reverting back, and um, I think we used this once. No by two. Uh, all of that is now intelligible to me. Um, no by two is when you go to a, a cafe and you order a cup of coffee and you ask it to be uh, split in two, but the, the 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 cafe owner puts a sign up saying no by two. Um, How so you can you only learn have that? How did oh, you know I, that? you taught me that about two and a half did years I? ago. Yes, you did. did right. So these were the challenges, but um, I think it all worked well. My it, it, sorry. Uh, sorry. English is better. Um, I was just going to ask, a, a thought just occurred to me. I mean, did you um, disagree at any point in a fundamental way? And if you did, did that shape the book or not? Um. Shall I take it, John, first? Please, Deb. Um, I won't say disagree, but uh, we have had a long running debate on what's it that we are exactly witnessing in India. Uh, there is all kind of language you hear, uh, this populism backsliding of democracy, which John hates the word backsliding, and um, even fascism. Uh, or the last one in particular, fascism, uh, has been central to these debates. And um, we have often discussed this. We have not agreed on certain things, but this is an ongoing debate. And uh, I won't see these are, I won't call these disagreements, but uh, there are some unresolved issues, let's say, between me and John over, over these debates. John. Well, I, I think the issue of, of um, the serious things uh, that are going on in India, which our book tries to grasp, and the problem of naming them, uh, was indeed, the, uh, as Deb says, the, 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 the core of a, a long-running discussion. And on the question of fascism, it's a word that um, is being uh, thrown around at the moment to describe Modi's government. Um, my misgivings about the word is that um, are several. Uh, the word, I think, uh, is a lazy word. It seems to have, you know, a lot of punch in it, but it's lazy in the sense that it supposes that um, there are no novelties, that this is a repetition of things that happened in the 20s and 30s in Italy and Germany and Japan, for instance. And technically, um, I think that um, what our book uh, shows is that um, this is not fascism. This is something new. 
Technically, fascism is a type of political order, a type of politics where there is a demagogue, there is a single party, which rules um, through mass mobilizations of people, through total fear and the secret police, and through um, an all-embracing coherent ideology. Well, some of those elements um, we describe in the book, but if, for example, you just take the question of ideology, I think that um, the Modi BJP phenomenon is slippery, uh, much more slippery and, and more kaleidoscopic. You know, that Modi himself can play the role of a humble chai walla. Um, he can be um, the servant, the das of the people. Uh, he's a nation builder. He's grown his beard long to be like some Hindu ascetic uh, king. Um, he celebrates Diwali in military uniform with, with, with soldiers. Um, he's business friendly. He has good friends, uh, Mukesh Ambani, for instance. Um, he does Hindutva, you know, no, take no prisoners. Uh, there's a strong anti-Muslim uh, sentiment uh, to it all. The point I'm making is that um, in, in his discourse, in, in, in his um, public language, uh, he's a kind of chameleon. You know, he comes dressed in a coat of, of many colors. And this is, this is, it's a kind of kitchery. It's, this is something new. And one other difference with uh, 1920s and 30s fascism is that, of course, um, he does elections and, and there are elections and they're very important in the Indian polity. Fascists of the 20s and 30s and uh, early 40s didn't like elections. So um, the puzzle uh, that we wrestled with was um, the, the problem of, of, of naming this phenomenon. And we came up with the word despotism to describe um, it. Uh, and it is our way of saying that this is not a repetition of things that happened in the 20s and 30s. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you, John. Um, uh, just a reminder to people that um, if you'd like to ask a question, we're already getting some fantastic questions in the ask a question function on Crowdcast. Put them in there, not in the chat function, but ask a question and we will come to those in due course after I've finished hogging the conversation for a while. Um, just a brief one, though. Sebastian has asked, why is the book so highly priced in India? Want to read the book? The price is really prohibitive. Um, Sebastian, don't worry. We are actually producing uh, a, an edition that will be in, entirely uh, appropriately priced for the uh, Indian market, and that will be coming out in due course. The, the current world just makes that more difficult than it was before, but we will be doing that very, very soon. So there will be a, a, a book you can you can hold in your hand and read, I sincerely hope. so. My mother can hold in her hand and read. Right, which, well, we can probably do a free one actually for her, Deb, but let's talk about that offline. Um, <laughs> let's give people, John, you started to touch on this quite a bit, but let's give people a, a, a slightly fuller insight into what it is that you actually do in the book. Um, India is the world's largest democracy, uh, okay. democracy on a scale never before imagined or achieved in terms of numbers of people, in terms of geographic scope, in terms of diversity, in terms of strength of feeling, religious feeling, and so on. Uh, so the common view is it's, it's an extraordinary success. But, I mean, that's received wisdom. You begin by suggesting, I think, that the picture is much more complicated and in, indeed more troubling than that. We do. Um, the book opens uh, with um, a description of what's being called the India story. The India story you've already mentioned, uh, Dominic, is uh, the story that India is the world's largest democracy. And this is the kind of language uh, that you hear in the Quad negotiations, uh, Japan, India, uh, the US and Australia. Uh, it's also the language that we're beginning to hear in the great Joe Biden drama, you know, this global drama that there's a, an historic struggle going on between autocracy and democracy. And India is said to be part of uh, the latter. Actually, this story, um, uh, in a curious Orientalist twist, has been kept alive, we uh, uh, explain in the opening uh, of the book, uh, by, outside, um, by outside talk. I mean, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, 
and with China as competitor in the background, every American president, um, the, and uh, Hillary Clinton as well, Obama and so on, have all praised India as the world's largest uh, democracy. Uh, I think the high point of this was the Namaste um, Trump rally at uh, a big cricket stadium, which is now called the Narendra Modi uh, Stadium in uh, Ahmedabad. Uh, in February of 2020, where they embraced, and it was, you know, the world's oldest and the world's largest democracy. That's the India story. What we say um, in the opening pages of the book is that there are more than a few grains of truth in this. India survived partition, bloody and violent. Um, it snubbed Churchill's view that there could never be parliamentary democracy in India because it wasn't um, a nation. It was, as he said repeatedly, an abstraction, um, no more than a mere line on, on the equator. Um, a brilliant constitution was written, um, uh, introduced at the end of uh, 1949. Um, the world's largest elections happened in 1951 and uh, 52, uh, where more than 175 million women and men voted uh, in the world's largest electoral uh, exercise. India committed itself to an entirely different understanding of secularism, not the French nor the American. Um, the, the idea was that India is a patchwork quilt of different faiths, religions, uh, Jains, Christians, Hindus, Muslims, and so on, uh, Buddhists, uh, and that the function of government is to protect those faiths and actually to empower equally those faiths. This was all uh, remarkable stuff. And India, we point out, also, unlike um, most post-colonial regimes, never succumbed to military dictatorship. It came close to doing that under the rule of Mrs. Gandhi, who made the mistake of agreeing to go to a general election in 1977 and lost. Uh, so um, that emergency uh, was uh, that that emergency was was set aside. However, what we say in this book is that the India story uh, has a certain myth mythical quality because Democracy, if democracy, as is stated in the Constitution, is a whole way of life where people live their daily lives in dignity, sharing uh, as equals a sense of empowerment, of, of freedom, um, then it's the destruction of the social foundations of the democracy that uh, gives the lie to the India story. And that's what the rest of the book tries to, to explain. Fascinating. It's, a, it's an extraordinary account of an extraordinary country, I think. But you've also got something bigger to say about the very nature of democracy uh, and the kind of conditions that it, that it needs to survive and indeed thrive. And I, dare I say this, um, that goes against a lot of the scholarly literature on that particular topic, scholarly literature that I've spent a good chunk of my life trying to propagate. So is that fair? John, yeah, you take... No, John, uh, I will let you take it because it's about scholarly li literature probably. You're better placed to take this. Thank you for the upgrade. <laughs> I, I, I think, uh, yes, I think there is, um, you know, a very strong tendency uh, uh, in the scholarly literature to suppose that uh, quintessentially democracy is about free and fair elections and multi-party system. Um, others would add that it needs, you know, a framework of a written constitution and uh, courts, and it needs uh, freedom of communication. Um, we add in the book that democracy, in addition to um, elections, is also about public scrutiny of power. Um, you know, the, the right to information uh, uh, laws in India are used by between four and six million people a year um, to try to find out things. Um, so democracy is also monetary democracy. But in this book, uh, we go further and we say 
against quite a lot of the literature on democracy, we say it's an old fashioned but forgotten idea that democracy is also a whole way of life. It is um, freedom from hunger. It is, it is decent public transportation. It's the right of women not uh, to feel fear when they walk the streets day or night. It is um, a, a way of life, a sharing of power, self-government of people where children don't go to bed hungry at night. Um, and that's an elementary point that runs through the whole book. We tell it in stories. We, we um, theorize it, um, I think, in good language as well. But Deb has much more to say about um, this central part of the book, which is about the social foundations of, of uh, democracy. Right. Uh, so let me jump in there, because I think uh, uh, absolutely right. I mean, uh, 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 the thing that appealed to me in the end uh, about the book was that uh, when I was right at the start of it was that um, that it really was very successfully doing something that that a lot of academic literature doesn't do. Uh, so some of the life stories here are really extraordinary and, and really serve to vivify the book and its arguments. So they're not just dropped in. Um, Deb, those are very much down to you. Uh, and I Thank wonder you. if you might actually share a couple of those just to kind of drive home the points that you're both trying to make in, in the argument of the book. Right. Uh, so as I was saying that uh, I always thought that the life stories of people living in a democracy are are key to any narrative about democracy. And so what we have done with this book is that we have tried to tell the story of a dying democracy through the people living its slow motion death. And the idea was to bridge you know, the gap between or the popular uh, and the academic. And trust me, there is a lot of gap there. Um, I don't know how many times uh, it has uh, happened to me over the course of my field work in India. Uh, I have now lost count, but it would often so uh, happen that I would go to a conference or a seminar in India on democracy or maybe to interview somebody um, or who is an expert or a domain expert on democracy and come out of that interview or meeting and get on a cab or an auto, you know, the auto is the Indian tuk-tuk, uh, and start talking with the driver, uh, as I always do. And then we start getting to know each other and I ask him, and it's always him, um, you know, like where he's from, uh, how are things in the city, how are things in the village? And then uh, he asks after me, and uh, and the moment I say that I am writing a book on on democracy, it's always met with sarcasm. It's always met with something like, "We have democracy. India has democracy. Really, where is democracy? What are you writing about?" And then there will be a long rant on democracy in in India, and and then we have a laugh about it. So bear in mind, this is right after a very serious discussion on the state of democracy in India in an air-conditioned room with a domain expert and where I'm explained why it's backsliding or why it's progress so much, it's imperfections, et cetera. But, um, but out there uh, on the, or the man on the street has a completely different view. To him, democracy doesn't exist. Now, uh, he knows this in his gut. How does he know this? Um, or how did he come to this conclusion? Uh, he knows it from his lived experience, from the subhuman life that he lives in Islam, from the indignity of uh, having to use the ugly toilet that he shares with the others in the slum, from the dirty air he sucks in all day, or um, he knows it from the uh, struggles, for the daily struggles for water, from the daily compromises he has to make between his budget and his family's nutritional needs. Um, or he knows this from the poor or no education he received as a child and, and the poor education that his daughter is getting now from a badly run government school. And uh, from the frantic phone calls he gets from his wife 
if his teenage daughter is like um, 10 minutes late from school because oh, he knows that the city is not safe. And uh, so he knows that something is wrong with Indian democracy, probably doesn't exist. Or he knows it from the discrimination he still faces because of his caste. Um, he also knows it from the land that he had to sell in his village or to pay for his parents' uh, healthcare expenses, which forced him to come to the city or to work on subsistence wage. So well, the long and short of it is that there is this wide discrepancy between the lofty goals and declarations set out in the constitution uh, and the lived experience of uh, India's democracy. And this man who knows all about it, even though he has never read the constitution, all he knows is that the constitution was written by India's founding leaders. And this could not have been the life those patriots would have meant him to live 74 years after independence. So this man's life is the story of India's democracy failure. And we wanted to capture that in our section on social foundations of democracy. Uh, so well, the social foundations section begins with a chapter on uh, health, public health, and um, which was rewritten after, after COVID hit India. Uh, in that chapter, well, that chapter begins with the experience of a young HR executive or who takes his father to a public hospital or to get admitted. Uh, his, uh, her father was diagnosed, uh, diagnosed with uh, COVID, uh, was uh, having trouble breathing. And when they took him to the hospital, the hospital would not let him in and no hospital would uh, admit his, uh, her father. So they have these long arguments with doctors and, and she gets desperate or she starts tweeting and her tweets get viral. And this is how I found uh, her. I discovered her. And finally, after several hours of this, um, trying to get her father admitted into hospital, or her father dies in the car. Or he started collapsing and then he just dies. And, and when he dies, or she sends out a tweet or uh, saying, uh, oh, he's no more, the government failed us. And so that is the jump off point of, uh, of that chapter on public health, on the crisis of public health in India. This was last year, this was 2020 when COVID first hit India, not the second wave. Then um, we have a very fascinating um, chapter on mobility and and democracy it is my i mean i mean the whole uh, all the chapters i of course all the pages i love but but this chapter is my personal favorite because uh, you won't read a lot about democracy and mobility a lot in um, in normal discourse on democracy so uh, here in this chapter we explain how mobility physical mobility, how public transport, how physical infrastructure, or they facilitate democracy. And John loved a fascinating, I think, six, seven pages of introduction to this um, chapter where he explains uh, how democracy and, and physical mobility uh, have gone hand in hand or through history, how mobility breaks down social barriers, how it uh, encourages civic participation. So that chapter, oh, we have a couple of very interesting uh, characters. One person, there is one person uh, who is uh, who lost both his legs, Samit Javeri, uh, who lost both his legs. Uh, oh, he's based in Mumbai. Uh, while trying to cross railway tracks in uh, Mumbai, it was a dark rainy night and he didn't see the train coming and there was no foot bridge. So he tried to cross the tracks and, and he met with an accident and he lost his, uh, both his legs. And uh, he became uh, an activist who specializes in extracting through RTI, Right to Information Act, uh, the information on 
trains and the railways and on the basis of which if there is a mismatch between what the government is supposed to provide and what the government actually provides or he takes the government to court and um, guess uh, how many people lose their um, lives every day i'm not talking about losing limbs but um, how many people uh, die every year just in mumbai just trying to cross the uh, railway tracks it's about 1500 uh, in 2019 it was about 1500 and that's more or less the average so so that's a fascinating character then there is a man who lost his son to a pothole and you know like anybody who has traveled in india or lives in india knows that its roads are even in big cities the roads are uh, filled with potholes and there was this big pothole uh, it had rained that morning and his son was going to college to take admission he was on a bike with his cousin and they didn't see the pothole and 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 they met with an accident and his son died instantly uh, this man uh, bill hore mr bill hore uh, Dadara Bill Hore, uh, he now, oh, he started filling up potholes because oh, he thought, well, if I can fill a pothole, I will probably save a life. And as he started filling up potholes, more and more people started joining him. And it became a foundation and it has become a big thing. Uh, students have joined him, they have created a spotter pothole app in which if you find a pothole, you can take a photo of the pothole and geotag it and it will automatically go to a central uh, database of potholes where uh, Dadara Bilhore and his team can see the pothole and, and they can decide which ones to fill, which ones not to fill. So this, this is an amazing, uh, you, uh, so we have tried to populate the book with characters like this. So apart from social foundations, uh, we have also, of course, uh, dealt with uh, the crisis of governing institutions in India. Because what, what we are witnessing now in India is a steady capture of institutions, uh, degradation of uh, institutional autonomy. And uh, there are chapters on media, judiciary, uh, elections and money, elections and violence, etc., etc. Um, so in the chapter on uh, election and uh, money or the role that dark money plays in elections or, or deeply anti-democratic role in tilting elections, I, I met this uh, amazing transgender woman in Vijaywara who was or who decided to run as an independent candidate against the chief minister's son. And so there is this contrast of the chief minister's son pouring in millions of rupees, giving out cash, uh, cash handouts, free air condition uh, machines, and uh, uh, all sorts of gifts. And there is this transgender woman who who works for a small NGO, or who lives in a sliver of a room. And uh, in that uh, Vijayawada summer heat. Or she goes around door to door, or she doesn't even have a car, uh, or she goes around door to door campaigning. And uh, so that was our jump off point for getting into the whole topic of money and elections and, and the frustration that I saw in her. You will see the same frustration in a lot of party workers across party lines in India, because they know that no matter how hard they try, uh, or the party will tend eventually or to pick somebody or to field in an election who is rich um, or who can use her own money in elections. So which uh, gives rise to a whole um, connection to uh, corruption and rent seeking and all that. Then we, uh, for the chapter on judiciary, I think it was one of my best encounters. Uh, in the chapter on judiciary, uh, I uh, or we begin the chapter with the mother and uh, wife of a man uh, who 
allegedly was part of a gang rape and murder, a sensational gang rape and murder of a doctor in the southern city of uh, Hyderabad. And um, so four people were arrested after, after this uh, rape and murder, uh, which rocked um, the whole country. And, and two days later, or they were killed in custody. Or the police said that they had taken the fort to the scene of the crime to recreate the crime scene. And uh, there, apparently, they suddenly started attacking the cops. And the cops, in self-defense, well, they had to kill the four men. But everybody knew what was going on. This was uh, extrajudicial killing. And there is a very Indian word for it, which uh, John did not mention this word uh, among the Indianisms that he has learned over two years. It's called encounter. And um, in, in police force across India, you have encounter specialists. Uh, these are cops who are um, or who specialize in killing people in custody, which would be unthinkable in any democracy. But these people are valorized in popular uh, culture, in Bollywood movies. Uh, so uh, I interviewed these uh, this man's wife and mother, um, who everybody has assumed that justice has been served, that these four were indeed guilty. But in the eye of the law and in their eyes, well, they still don't know what really happened, whether they were at all involved or not, or whether they were just picked off the street and killed. So mm -hmm. these are some of the characters that uh, we explored. Dominic. Gosh, Deb, thank you. Um, so a thought occurs to me as you were saying all that, uh, which is that earlier on I said that um, you make a case um, that there's huge resonance with the with the Indian experience, um, but a lot of those things you've been saying seem sort of exceptionalist, as it were. So uh, we've seen a world in which there's been a move to authoritarian and even despotic regimes over the last 10 or 15 years, and that's been, I think it's fair to say, quite a surprise to many people. And I speak as somebody that's published um, the leading scholarly series on democratization over the last 30 years. Um, so you make a strong case that we can actually learn from the Indian experience, but what is it that we can learn from it? Well, it ought to be of concern to um, anybody at this webinar and anybody who encounters this book uh, that um, the fate of democracy in India is of global significance. Um, and it's not just because one third of people who live in so named democracies live in India. It's because um, the case of India, so we argue in this book, uh, alerts us to another way in which democracies can slowly die. I mean, in, in the literature and in journalism, there are basically two reigning views of how democracies commit democide or are killed off. One is, you know, the sudden death view, the military coup d'etat, Morsi 2011 in Egypt, um, events in Bolivia in 2019, the dumping of uh, Yingluk Shinawat uh, in, I think, 2014 in, in uh, Thailand, um, the suicide of Salvador Allende in the presidential palace in Chile in, in the 1970s. These are examples of sudden death um, of democracies. There is another view which you can find in uh, Stephen Levitsky and my colleague at the WZB, uh, Danny Ziblatt's book on how democracies die, which is a kind of slow death explanation. Um, this was, this still is, I think, the predominant view about what Trump was doing to the United States. I mean, actually removing the guardrails, neutering uh, the Congress, uh, stacking the judiciary, um, mobilizing uh, parts of the bureaucracy for his uh, power grab, attacking journalists, and so on. What we say in this book is that um, 
In addition, there is another way in which democracies uh, uh, die or are killed, and it is through the degradation, the tearing apart, um, the rupturing, the, 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 the disesteeming, um, the humiliating of people in their daily social lives. Uh, and that ought to be obvious, but it's not said enough. Or so we say, if democracy is a way of life where people govern themselves, feel that they are equally dignified to share power, then the destruction of social life of the kind Deb was just explaining is a direct assault on the ethos of democracy. But there's something else that this book, um, um, uh, we hope, um, suggests to readers, which is that when the social foundations of a democracy are allowed to disintegrate, it's a problem in practically every existing democracy, including the United States, then the frustration, the anxiety, the disappointment can build to the point where up pops a party with a demagogue leader who plays the role of redeemer, someone who offers, uh, offers redemption, offers, offers um, the improvement of uh, people's social lives. And in the latter part of the book, we describe that in detail. It's in effect uh, an explanation about how democracies uh, can be killed using democratic means. Um, it was an old warning of Tocqueville in his great work on democracy in America that democracies should watch out uh, for um, the problem of despotism. That is, the problem of leaders and parties who would concentrate power in the name of the people and even redefine the people um, uh, and in this way destroy the flanking institutions um, and actually manage to win substantial support, you know, win a kind of voluntary servitude that democracy could be killed off, um, as it were, through the consent of uh, disesteemed people. Well. Um, if that sounds like an abstract possibility, consider Turkish dynamics. Consider the way Viktor Orban, otherwise known as Viktor Orban, in not more than 10 years managed to turn a power-sharing constitutional monetary democracy into something like a despotism. That's the warning that um, our book uh, issues, uh, that uh, democracy can be killed not only through military coup d'etat and not only through machinations and maneuverings at the governmental level, but also through the degradation of their social foundations and the kind of um, toxic politics that, um, that feeds upon that uh, disesteeming of, of people. Gosh, yes. Um, I mean, you, you will be forgiven for thinking on the basis of a lot of what we've spoken about so far today, that you've written a Jeremiah, but you do think that there's hope written throughout this story. Uh, how so? Well, uh, I'll take that John first and then let you uh, have the rest of it. Um, to me, at least, uh, India is, um, I see hope in the fact that 70 years of um, democratic participation has uh, sharpened or the democratic instincts of the people. So you cannot suddenly impose an autocratic structure on Indians. It won't work. And also India is, uh, is one country, but it's also in a way, it's a federation. It's a federation of very different cultures and uh, and there are very many languages in India. There are very many cultures. So to me, uh, democracy is the default setting of India. You cannot have any other kind of governing structure in, in India. So uh, which to me is a hope that there will probably not be a, an urban style uh, totalitarian regime in India because it will not probably work beyond a point. But um, 
so these are and like uh, there have been a lot of social progress and and all of that but uh, these two remain my main hope and since uh, john is the more hopeful kind of guy amongst us uh, i'll take john, take it from me right there well, I'm not sure about that, Deb, but um, uh, uh, but I'll leave my misery guts aside um, to just to add two things, if I may, um, before we move to questions. I, I first of all, you know, running through the book is the idea that there's something very special about the spirit and substance of democracy in its various forms, which is that it encourages when it takes root, as it has in India. Um, despite all of the, uh, the degradation that the book um, describes, when it takes root, it encourages people um, to sense that things can be changed, that the way power relations are now are not God-given, they are not natural, that they're mutable. And so in the book, Towards the End, we give examples of the way in which the spirit of democracy remains alive. Um, farmers protest against arbitrary imposition of um, new agricultural uh, pricing laws. Uh, women object uh, to um, a sanitary napkin tax that Modi tried to impose in 2018 and that had to be withdrawn. The other um, thing to say that perhaps um, it doesn't seem immediately obvious, but it's a little secret, if I may um, uh, reveal. Uh, it, it was Deb's brilliant idea to uh, call our book To Kill a Democracy, and the inspiration was Harper Lee's 1960 uh, great novel, To Kill a Mockingbird. I mean, this is a Gothic um, tale, a Southern Gothic tale, about um, racial and gender injustice. And it features, uh, readers will know, Atticus Finch. He's the kind of protagonist. He's a lawyer. He, he's the bearer of decency, of uh, rule of law, of, uh, of generosity, uh, of truthfulness. Um, so um, To Kill a Mockingbird is a novel one of the great American novels um, about um, the struggle of um, those qualities, those democratic qualities against um, the evils of uh, bigotry. And it may not be known um, to uh, people immediately that, you know, the mockingbird, if you've ever heard a mockingbird, a mockingbird um, is a generous bird. You know, it mimics other birds and it, it gives gifts, so to say, to others. I think that um, buried in our title, which sounds um, deathly, you know, to kill a democracy, are those connotations of, of the original um, uh, source of our title, to kill a mockingbird. Because um, as Harper Lee says in, in that novel, to kill, there's a line where um, it's said that to kill a mockingbird is evil. Well, what we are saying without using that word particularly is that um, the death of democracy, the killing of democracy in India would be a great disaster for Indians and also for, for the world. So it's hopeful um, in a kind of Harper Lee way. <laughs> Can I just say briefly that I was against that title when it was first mooted and I was wrong about that too. Um, uh, it's, also worth, it's also worth adding that when we first, when Deb first suggested, I thought it was a, it was too much an exaggeration, uh, right. too, 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 um, too in your face, too extreme. Uh, about two years ago, um, I would say we began to be gripped by the feeling that reality was running ahead of our book. Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Let me. I'm going to uh, switch now to the questions that people have have asked in the ask a question section of the Crowdcast website. Um, uh, folks, we're um, there's lots to say. We're uh, we're at five to the hour now. I'm going to suggest that um, if people can bear it and if they're happy to stay with us, then we go on for about another ten minutes or so beyond the allotted hour that we had. I'm not surprised that we've we've spilled over a little bit. So if you can bear with us, we're going to whiz through some questions now. I think some of them may have been answered a bit 
uh, during the course of the last hour, particularly the earlier ones. But I'm going to begin with um, Santano, who's asked um, a question, which I think the first part of this has probably been covered to some extent, but the second part I think is very, very interesting. So the first part is, what do you think is the main reason for the despotism in India that you'd named your book on? I think we've covered that to some extent. But do you think a change in the current regime government will make things better? Well, that's a great question. Sorry, could you repeat that, please? So do you think a change in the current regime or government will make things better? Well, so far it hasn't made anything better. Um, and whether the regime will change or not, um, uh, I mean, why would a despot feel the need to change if, if things are working for, for the despot perfectly? So as of now, we don't see anything, um, any sign of change in the uh, horizon. And may I add, uh, Deb, that um, one of the, the, the vital points um, running through our book is that this is not all the fault of the BJP and Modi, uh, that there are other despots um, past and present. Uh, KCR may not be known um, to, to our audience, um, the Chief Minister of Telangana, who um, at the beginning, during the first phase of lockdown, COVID-19 lockdown, you know, said personally uh, to the media that he would authorize um, uh, uh, a shoot on site policy for anybody who violated curfew mm -hmm. and who um, a number of times has likened himself to Hitler's grandfather. Um, there is a more serious uh, case um, that the book raises. Um, it's Deb's work. Um, Mamata Banerjee, Didi, elder sister, uh, chief minister in uh, Bengal, is possibly becoming the key rival um, to Modi. But if you look at um, her background and her style of politics, it has a lot of the, the, the content is different, but the style is, is very similar to that of, uh, of, of Modi. So the worrying thing is that um, uh, this despotic trend is not just at the center, it is exactly. happening in, in states. And the hope that runs through this book is I think comes from, it's grounded in uh, the society. It is in a way the, the resistance of a civil society against these trend that is the hope for Indian democracy, or so we say. I'm gonna jump into the next question now, which is Colin from Tulbert. It's an excellent question. I think the early part of this, but it, the, the, um, the heading here is Indian federalism, and it's a fantastically important question. I think to what degree are the trends you observe at the federal level in India replicated in all or some states? Are there states that are resisting this trend and are the constitutional protections for states working? Colin asks. And then uh, Jill um, underlines that as well. We need to know this. India is not just what happens at the high federal level. We really like to know what is happening in Kerala, for example. So that's a terrific question, I think, in a federal system. Okay, so this is the uh, one thing about the book which is, I think, uh, is uh, worth bearing in mind. That this book avoids the trap of treating Indian politics from the lens of, through the lens of federal politics. So every chapter, uh, we are very mindful of that, and every chapter deals with a different state in India. And, um, but some of the despotic trends, which uh, John mentioned that you have seen in uh, Bengal, uh, I grew up in Bengal and and when I was growing up, the communists were in power in Bengal. Outside Cuba and China, this is the place where the communists have ruled the longest for 34 years. And I grew up watching the communists capture all kinds of uh, state institutions using intimidation and coercion as tool of governance. And, um, and nothing changed. Then Mamata Banerjee took over, more violence, more coercion, more intimidation. So um, every state, so you see these despotic trends in different states as well, as he mentioned KCR, as John mentioned KCR as well. Even at the federal level, what we are seeing now today 
is actually a replication of a state model. This is what, this is how Modi ruled Gujarat for 12 years, the completely despotic rule. So what Modi did as when he became the prime minister is that he brought his chief ministerial style of governance, which was very successful in uh, Gujarat. And uh, he's trying to replicate it at the center. So uh, there is some correlation between what we are seeing at the federal level and, and what we see at the state levels in India. As well. uh, so these are not completely different trends. There are similarities. Very interesting, thank you. Um, uh, our next question is um, from Volkan Merkel, but I'm actually, Volkan, forgive me, um, dear friend, I'm gonna uh, uh, jump over that because it's asking something which I think we've covered to some extent and we have a lot of very good questions. So uh, Stuart asked a question which uh, moves us into the world of geopolitics, which I think it will be very interesting to touch on if you two are okay about doing that. And the question goes as follows, a major reason that Indian democracy is championed so strongly in the West, particularly in the US is for the anticipated counterbalance that a democratic India will provide against a despotic China in a coming Cold War. How, if at all, do you think the killing of Indian democracy will play into the superpower conflicts of the near future? So we're broadening our net a bit there. John. I, I'm happy to stick my neck out. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, of course, uh, our book, um, calls into question that India story, you know, the, the, the largest democracy on the face of the earth, ergo, a friend of the West, um, a natural partner of the American alliance, um, and now, you know, a core participant in the grand historical drama of autocracy versus democracy. Um, we call that into question pretty radically so, and that causes a problem for that way of speaking about India. I would say um, two other things about the geopolitics of this. Um, we are expecting that there will be a warm reception of this book in China. It, ironically, uh, it shows um, that a functioning democracy uh, can be killed off, that it neglects um, the dignity of its people and so on. And this is a major Chinese um, uh, party objection to so-called democracies. So the book might be thought to be um, an ode to the China model. Um, I don't think it is, last point, I think that running through this book is um, an understanding of democracy as much more than ticking boxes and pressing buttons uh, during an election. It is more than, uh, than the public scrutiny of uh, power. It is more um, than a way of life. It is a way, democracy is a way absent or in short supply in China, it is a way of um, bringing those who govern back to earth. Um, it is a way of um, uh, institutionalizing accountability, preventing the abuses of power wherever uh, that happens. Uh, so it's geopolitically, this book is, is a complicated um, little pink number. Um, it, it, it is to the Chinese mill. It is a plague upon quad talk of India as a democracy, but running through it is a, is a defiant uh, defense of what I would say is a new 21st century argument for democracy, that democracy is um, a way of preventing hubris, a way of, um, uh, of ensuring that those who rule either in the corporate world or um, in government, don't wander into cuckoo land. One thing I might want to uh, add to this is uh, on the specific question of how this will, how India's passage to despotism affects geopolitics. 
I would say it probably doesn't much affect geopolitics because, and I have written about this in the Time magazine, is um, uh, Biden will um, continue to pretend that Modi's India is a democratic ally because um, because by uh, US, you will also have to bear in mind, um, is an ally of Saudi Arabia. So, you know, democracy is not the cornerstone of uh, international relations for the US. It, it might talk about democracy in, in Asia, but in the Middle East, uh, it's, um, well, the US is in bed with all kinds of despotic governments. Uh, so it's not really a problem. So as long as uh, the China threat is uppermost in America's geopolitical calculations, no matter what Modi does in India, Biden will continue to pretend that it's a democracy. Okay. Dominic. Very interesting. Thank you, uh, Deb. Um, I'm going to take two questions together now because I think they're very linked. One from Tatanka, is Indian society intrinsically undemocratic? And then David, David Pritchard asks, why is democracy in danger in India? Is the main cause indigenous to India itself? Or are there shared global reasons why India is following other democratic polities in trouble? John, would you like to take that? Well, I, I, I thought um, to the first question, I think, um, you know, talk of intrinsic, um, uh, you know, anti-democratic um, features of society. I think our book answers, and I think we have already um, more than hinted that, you know, there are trends and counter trends at the social level um, in the field of everyday life. Uh, the book um, details, you know, the, the growth of wage slavery. Uh, it details partly um, thinking in terms of Amartya Sen's famous thesis that no democracy ever witnessed a famine. What we show is actually there's a slow motion, invisible uh, famine that, that grips um, many millions of, of people and many children go to bed hungry at night and many children are stunted, deformed and so on. So there are those trends, but there is also the spirit of Satyagraha. You know, there is the spirit of resistance, of, 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 of objections to um, abuses of power. So that dynamic, um, I think we capture well in uh, the book. Um, uh, to to David and the tricky question and great question of whether you know that there's something specifically Indian about these dynamics. I think um, the tone of the book, uh, without being preachy at all, the tone of the book is that when you read this book, you you will you will see that there are parallel dynamics happening in many democracies. And, you know, to be blunt about it, um, for 40 years, most actually existing democracies under the impact of neoliberalism, privatization, deregulation, um, the growing gap between rich and poor, that most democracies are suffering Indian, um, uh, uh, the Indian disease, so to say. And the warning of this book um, is that India uh, is um, not only a bellwether um, uh, of things um, that are happening and to come potentially, but um, the lesson is from the case of particular case of India, the more general lesson is that those democracies that neglect because of poor welfare provisions, that neglect their social foundations are asking for trouble. So, John, you are saying that there is a Delta variant of democracy, which the world has to be careful about. Yeah, right. journalists through and through, I think that. <laughs> um, I'm going to um, take another two questions together because they touch on something as a political science editor that is dear to my heart, which is party systems. So uh, Robert asks, please discuss the party system and the growing polarization in democracies that is having negative impacts 
such as social problems and less trust, etc., in politicians. And Alistair asked, do you address the role of parties and factions in the decision-making process in politics in the book? Yes, we uh, do very much. Uh, uh, we address the party legislative system and we explain how uh, the political parties in India are uh, surprisingly extremely undemocratic themselves. Or they do not have internal elections. Most parties are uh, dynastic, mom and pop shops, uh, and and all parties are run by a handful of men or uh, women. Uh, Indian ruling party, for example, is basically run by two two men, and um, and this is a common affliction among uh, in in India. And um, for the legislative system, again. Um, I think uh, we have uh, we have a chapter called uh, elective despotism, where we explain how uh, parliamentary procedures uh, make sure that you know lawmakers, even lawmakers, cannot question their uh, parties because of uh, or the system of whip, whips, uh, or they cannot take a stand against the party. So anybody who controls a party uh, essentially controls the legislature as well if they if the party has a brute numerical majority in the house so or the party system in the party system uh, in the party legislative system uh, any challenge to you know establish democracy you would have a challenge to the leadership first from the party and then in the legislature which is impossible in India because if you have, if you are a head of a ruling party, you have full control of the ruling party and you have full control of the legislature. Mm -hmm. So these checks and balances are completely absent in India, which is a part of the despotic, uh, part of the reasons why we have a despotic trend in India. And may I add that um, these uh, two questions about parties um, will find, the questioners will find um, pretty interesting material, including uh, some unknowns or not widely known uh, uh, features of the party system. For example, resorting. Uh, resorting is uh, when there's a power struggle in a parliament and, and a party uh, boss uh, literally um, kidnaps um, the waverers and takes them to a resort. And there there's heavy words and um, probably gifts uh, uh, of exchange to persuade them to stay on board to um, prop up a government. I mean, this is extraordinary. I, I would um, add one other thing to what Deb had to say relevant to, to parties. One, one of um, the worrying uh, features of the trends that we describe in this book um, is captured, I think, in a remark by Shashi Tarua, um, uh, writer, um, public figure, Congress um, man, um, diplomat, who um, has said quite a lot in, in uh, the last couple of years that India is a developing country uh, in an advanced state of decay. Uh, and that applies to Congress party. You know, it's the lack of a viable, robust opposition party um, that has disintegrated, that is feeding these despotic trends. Very interesting. I'm going to, I'm very conscious now that we've outstayed our welcome to some extent. We're 50 minutes past our allotted time. I'm going to um, pick one last question. And my profound apologies to those of you who've asked questions that we've not managed to get to. Um, I hope that this conversation can be carried on in different ways. Um, first of all, by buying and reading the book. But the last question goes as follows, and it's a fascinating one, I think, because I am personally and professionally interested in the way in which cities are starting to impact global politics. And it goes as follows. Could the rise of super cities states improve or even topple the concept of democratic federalism? Sean. That's for you, Deb. No, that's for you, man. This is too, uh, <laughs> or too theory for me. Well, um, 
I mean, it is a great question, uh, and uh, it, it's undoubtedly the case that uh, on various points on our planet, cities uh, are new laboratories of democratic innovation. Uh, that's true in the greening of cities. It's true in public transportation, um, uh, the wiring up of communications, um, um, uh, citizens' assemblies. I mean, you know, those um, butterfly bridges. Uh, I mean, these are all innovations that are happening in cities, and they are counter trends to um, the decadence and decay of 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 democracies. Um, the picture that we present in the book um, features such cities as uh, Mumbai and Delhi. Um, those pictures are not altogether um, pretty. Uh, as for super cities, um, I mean, there is a Chinese variant of this. Um, and it seems to me Deb and I would need to discuss it, but it seems to me that that model is doesn't have a lot to do with democracy. It has it has a lot to do with um, concentrated governance. Um, so uh, it may be that that China model is a warning about the dangers of super cities. Much much more um, uh, democratically. Um, plausible, viable, it seems to me, is the networking of cities. And that that is one of the, you know, the entanglement of cities at a distance, almost a sort of quantum dynamic, where cities share innovations, um, uh, uh, share ideas, um, practices, and so on. And, and they have enlivening effects on, on life of uh, the citizens in those respective cities. But it's a great question. It needs further work, I'm sure. Many thanks. I, I lied, I'm afraid, because Anna Lesh Kumar, thank you, Anna Lesh, has uh, uh, asked the question and then raised the point about it. Uh, I'm going to uh, mention his point, first of all, which I think is a little unfair, which is why I'm rising to the bay. But he says, I think your panel just reflected the problem with Indian democracy. You've ignored one of the most voted questions, despite promising of being democratic. Thanks for bringing the problem alive. Well, thanks, Anna Lesh. I take that point. It was well made. Anna Lesh's original question was, could you explain what is unique about despotism in India as the deflation of the globalization bubble has created a similar sense in several countries? Now, and the reason I didn't go to that one is I think we did cover that to some extent in uh, our original set of questions. But if if Deb or John has something extra to add to that, then I'd be very, very um, pleased to hear it now. John is the expert on despotism, so I'll... Uh... Yeah, the minister for despotism. Uh, I, I, you know, it's a it's a long discussion and it's an excellent question. I I I, I would um, here partly repeating uh, the point that made earlier that um, this book details a way of building a political form which we call despotism which is concentrated centralized power and wealth where business and government um, moguls are entangled. We call it polygarchy, in which despotism is um, a form of state capitalism, centralized state power, um, where independent judiciaries are neutered, uh, where the parliament doesn't function properly as a check and balance monitoring institution, where journalists are called prostitutes, Modi's you know favorite term, uh, where um, the civil service is mobilized in support of the central power, and all of this is done in the name of the people. Well, one of the um, just one point to add about. Um, uh, an, an Indian variant of all of this is that the building of a despotism requires a government, a demagogue, a leading party to do what um, Bertolt Brecht in a famous poem of the early 50s recommended sarcastically. You know, when governments and politicians become unpopular, there is an option that those governments can... Um, re-elect a people. So if the people don't like the government, then what the government can do is create a new people. Um, and we see um, and say 
at some length in this book that something like that is going on unless um, it is checked. There is an attempt by, at the center, by Modi's BJP government to pasteurize the people. This means, um, as many Indians know, this means creating outgroups, creating enemies of the people. Um, there are 200 million Muslims uh, who live in India. And at the moment, they are being battered, uh, invisibilized, discriminated against. Um, police inaction um, is part of their lives. Um, so um, the building of a despotism in the name of a people, in the name of democracy, functionally requires, um, paradoxically, eliminating some flesh and blood people. And that is a real danger for, for Indian uh, democracy. Um, it's a long-winded answer to um, an excellent question. Thank you so much, John. And indeed, I'm going to have to draw a line under proceedings there. Thank you for everyone who's joined us today, especially Deb and John, for their contribution and also for writing this superb book. I, I hope you've all enjoyed our conversation. I hope it's been illuminating, uh, illuminating enough to, to want to read more. Um, this really is a, a terrific volume, I think, and also an important one. Um, I haven't mentioned this to John or, or Deb before, but the two the two key books I'd read on India up until working with them on this volume were, I, I hate to mention him now, V.S. Nye Paul's book from the 1980s uh, and then Perry Anderson's book. And this this book is just, it's in a different, it's in a different league of, of nuance and interest and understanding, I think. And so I do urge you to get it when you can get it. Um, buy it says buy it. I can't believe I ended on that. But anyway, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And uh, take care. Thank you.